is quite an extraordinary subject for you all to consider tonight. I'm going to call this um, subject the angels of hell. The angels of hell. I'm not referring of course to the belonging of these angels to hell but they are taking in the words of this parable verses 47 to 50 they are taking the wicked they're severing them from the just and they are consigning them to hell now this is a very solemn subject indeed very very solemn indeed and you will not hear many messages on the subject of hell you just simply won't i can i can promise um, adam and katie and and jamie lee and chris we know he's come to know the lord uh, more recently um, quite recently as well i can promise you you'll visit many churches and listen to many sermons before you come across a message on this subject it's a subject that it's not for the prevalence in the new testament far from it let me give you some statistics this is quite extraordinary jesus preached more on hell than heaven now perhaps you knew that already he preached twice as much on hell as heaven let me give you another statistic I, I didn't know this until very very recently Jesus preached more on hell than he did preach on the love of God and that came from some very reliable theological sources very reliable indeed there's another one I came across all of the other writers in the New Testament put them all together didn't preach on hell as much as Jesus now why this divine preoccupation with this subject of eternal separation from God well why why should Jesus be so obsessed as it were uh, with this subject well I believe God designed it to be so because this subject is so unpalatable to your average human being the idea of final justice and eternal damnation it's so uh, it's so foreign to them and, and the, the reaction against it is is sometimes so vociferous that it needs the affirmation that the, 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 the confirmation of this all coming from the Savior's lips to to once and for all make it clear to all and sundry this is very much a crucial part of the gospel a crucial crucial part of God's Word and must be preached must be preached else you're not preaching the full gospel of God we concentrate on heaven and uh, understand why people concentrate on heaven but there needs to be an awareness not with what just what we've been saved to but what we've been saved from that is a very you know it's a, it's a fact I've seen this in my own in my own cousin I have a lovely cousin whose name is Elaine her name is Elaine beautiful girl just a tiny bit older than me and she was contracted with a with with a breast cancer very aggressive form of it now she would have been only she might have been late 30s you know and we were fearful for her she underwent some very severe treatment indeed and um, came through with um, flying colors uh, and is very apparent to me that she's changed now I'm talking about spiritually now I pray for her and I, I believe she will be the Lord's um, she will be become a Christian because she's very open to these things indeed whenever we talk about them uh, but I'm just talking about she's had a life-changing experience when you have a near-death experience when you think what could have been the horror of that disease uh, one of my managers in Aberdeen 
her funeral was on Friday a young mother of two breast cancer um, very solemn indeed been off sick for some time didn't just happen suddenly uh, Suzanne very solemn indeed uh, Elaine she now has a different perspective in life that's her, her perspective has changed dramatically now that's just humanly speaking you have a near-death experience you 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 have a, a very close shave it, it suddenly makes you aware of your mortality suddenly it makes you ever so aware of the fact that that you're um you're very frail the Bible says you're just like a vapor no sooner do you appear as those uh, windows over there would testify no sooner does the vapor appear upon them because of the clash of hot and cold and it's gone it's finished it's away life just seems to go before you know it and experiences such as that give you a tremendous perspective in life and an experience of what you've been saved from what God has done for your soul as a Christian and if you're not a Christian the, the hell that you're hurtling towards oh how needy it is that we get before the Savior we repent and believe the gospel very uh, unusual subject I know first of all I want to deal with the eye for the illustration that Jesus uses there's three ways to fish I've done um, a bit of fishing uh, disastrous I have to say um, not not good not a good experience um, being cooped up in a in a mini Cooper and it wasn't the one that you get these days it was a it was a smaller one about 20 25 years ago I was up in I think it was Thurso some lock somewhere this chap took me out uh, to, to, to fish sat in this boat and these silly tiddlers that we kept catching it was a real waste of time and, and energy maybe I just had a bad experience I just had a bad day at it but there's only three ways to fish that still even though you find them here in the scriptures over 2,000 years ago they still the same three three ways of being of fishing it persists today number one is your, your rod and your line uh, Jordana and I were at, were at Newcastle and we went to um, after a meal that we had in the evening having worked the day we went to South Shields Pier and there were some of these people uh, casting their lines out into the ocean the pier went right out into the sea uh, they were fishing that's one way the second way was a, a net that one person could wield that net would have uh, weights upon it and those weights uh, could be cast uh, out um, to the nearby uh, to the nearby water where you were standing you'd, you'd wade in as far as you can uh, you'd have the net with all the weights around about it you see a shoal of fish and it was very um, skillful what they did in fact you'll find that Andrew and Peter were doing this when Jesus called them and the, this net would would go out you'd cast it you'd, you'd then quickly scoop in the fish that had wandered into it and by that means uh, you would catch fish you'd put them over your shoulder you'd take them back to the shore and you'd eat them you'd sell them you would uh, you would um, uh, do whatever you did with them um, certainly not an expert in that in that department but this this net could be utilized to catch more than one then there was the drag net that's this one that, that, that Jesus is referring to this could be up to half a mile long this was a monster of a net and it would be anchored at the shoreline and then the boat would take the drag net and in a great arc would sweep the drag net that we all weighted down so that the, the net went as low to the uh, to the sea floor as possible almost certainly Galilee it would be dragged across Galilee um, and then eventually having done the arc and it'd be brought back to the the shoreline uh, it would take many fishermen to drag it in because they would have an enormous amount of fish contained in this net they would drag them all in 
to the shore but the only trouble with this net is it caught everything absolutely everything it was indiscriminate it didn't just catch cod or haddock or place it caught everything all the rubbish in the sea um, the other animals in the sea also were all caught up in this so there had to be a great sifting of all of this fish or life that was contained in the sea there had to be um, someone or many actually who would sit down having gathered in and drew this great net to the shore they would sit down gather the good into vessels so that was the fish that were decent they put them in vessels where there was water so that the fish would remain alive to keep them as fresh as possible and the bad would be gathered and the bad would be cast away into baskets where it would be disposed of so this is the picture Jesus again is looking at something that everyone knows about everyone sees everyone watches this they see the fishermen they see in fact the disciples themselves were fishermen that's how um, real this illustration was and you have this illustration the three types of fishing the dragnet being the one that as Jesus beheld it and he saw the men sitting down sifting through what they had caught he could tell they could see rather as they as they put the fish that were they would keep uh, in the vessels to, to keep them alive for freshness sake and the removal of the other stuff the rubbish if you like into into baskets of waste he saw the kingdom of heaven being acted out before him and the separation of the just from the wicked into eternal hell so that's the illustration that Jesus witnessed now let's come to the indignation the indignation and what you've got to understand when it comes to hell what you've got to appreciate you've got to appreciate is just how bad sin is why does God bring to bear hell upon sinners and upon sin why such a an extraordinary um, and extreme punishment eternal punishment for something um, such as sin and you've got to you've got to appreciate the wickedness of sin now this is very difficult to preach indeed very difficult to preach indeed because have I as I've sat and I've mused and I've thought long and hard about the wickedness of sin Oh, there's plenty of examples of that isn't there but it's how far do I go to make my point it's how far do I um, do I go to to graphically show you how bad sin is how bad man is you know there's all sorts of things I could uh, call upon think of the wars that are going on we're seeing blooded babies aren't we on our television screens just now we're seeing Christians running up the hills in Iraq chased by um, Muslim Islamists who are cutting people in half kids in half it's hideous it's terrible I can't I can't um, possibly oh in this time I've got do it justice how wicked man is we've got the abortion statistics that are just hideous as well um, the unborn and the, and the terrible uh, thing that's been performed upon them in this day and age but I came across something that I just just made me sick in my stomach now forgive me I've got to illustrate the wickedness of mankind to you and the wickedness of sin and the fact that the only remedy for it is hell the only remedy for, for sin and sinners is hell is hell that people say God loves the sinner but hates the sin no it's not true God hates the sinner it's not sin that goes into hell it's the sinner's sin and the sinner that goes into hell and this uh, subject cropped up it was a conference at it it was being chaired by David Cameron so the Prime Minister of Great Britain was involved 
in this incident, sorry, in this, in this subject. Uh, and the, in, the, in the conference, um, they were reporting uh, 20,000 incidents of what I'm about to share with you in Britain. In Britain. And currently, 140 million people, women, are suffering from this in the on the on this in this world you see what you're referring to david now this is this i just want to paint this picture for you to, to give you the extent of wickedness that's in the heart of man i'm referring to female genital mutilation now it's wicked i'm not going to go into any more detail than that but this is something that's prevalent 89 percent of women suffer from that in sierra leone many 27 countries in total you have you have women because of the culture involved now what i couldn't get over is 20,000 women this is happening to them in britain now what is in man's mind man's heart to do such wickedness to perform such hideous atrocities average age eight Eight. Sometimes as late as 15. I read this and I thought this is diabolical. 130,000 women currently suffering from the aftermath of, of FGM in uh, this country. But 140 million, it's a hideous statistic, isn't it? And you know what? It's very difficult to quantify. Why is it difficult to quantify? Well, obviously, because it's hidden and people um, in different cultures uh, hide the, the fact that it's going on and it's, it's just dreadful. It's just dreadful. If you really want to delve into the depths of wickedness in men, there's plenty of places you can go to, but there's a place to start. It's just awful, the wickedness that's in man's heart. Why? Why he would do these things? These things are born in hell, aren't they? These things are wickedness, piled upon wickedness. We see the use of rape in wars. These aren't isolated. This is not just one-offs. It's not like a, a bad day um, uh, on, on a particular, in, in a particular war. This is a commonplace usage of terror and terrorization of myriads of people. What you've got to understand is the sin problem is rampant, is evil, is beyond belief, beyond your imagination. You imagine how wicked man is? He goes way beyond that. Way beyond that. Man's inhumanity against man, the, root, the wars, the rumors of wars. There's enough food to blast this planet several times over and to feed it every day. Why do one billion not even get one meal a day? Man! Man is a cancer. He is utterly sold under sin. The only thing redeemable about man is when the grace of God gets a hold of him. That's the only thing. That's the only thing that stops this world going into complete and utter anarchy. And some would say that one day that will happen. And that's when Jesus will return again. Which brings us to the, 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 um, the time that this parable will be seen will be performed look at verse uh, verse 49 so shall it be at the end of the world now I've described to you a terrible thing and there's many more things I've touched on but I could go on and on and on the terrible greed that's in our in our land um, the terrible culture of of of, um, of greed that's left um, countless thousands millions uh, without a home there's there's all sorts of of cruelty um, money spent on arms civil wars to the detriment of children having milk to, to survive on to 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 um to drink to to grow to become become strong at the end of this world when sin is at its zenith it's at its height. It's at its most horrendous. That's what happened when, when Noah, when Noah um, 
was told to move with fear and build that ark, it says every imagination of man was evil continually. Continually. Day and night. Incessant evil. And God intervened. Such a day will reoccur. And it will be at the end of the world. Now there's only two things. There's only two remedies for this wickedness called sin. And the, the stain upon this earth of man in all his wickedness. There's only two things that can deal with the depth of sin. That can match it. That can contain it and overcome it. One is hellfire, is damnation it, for eternity. Two is the grace of God through the Lord Jesus Christ. They're the only two things that can, well with hell it contains sin. It performs justice upon uh, the sinner. With the Lord Jesus the justice was performed upon him at the cross oh and this is this is the uh, the awfulness the awfulness let me let me um share with you a couple of scriptures a couple of scriptures you remember the um the awful anger of god with the egyptians he sent different plagues and those plagues were performed upon the egyptians by angels by God sending angels. Listen to what the scriptures say in Psalm 78 and verse 49. He that is God cast upon them the fierceness of his anger, wrath and indignation and trouble by sending evil angels upon them. He made a way to his anger. He spared not their soul from death, but gave their life over to the pestilence it's happened before in time it will happen again in eternity God will send his angels so I'm calling this message angels of hell because God has angels people like to think of everyone has their angel and your angel looks after you and there's certainly scriptural uh, uh, proof of uh, such a blessing for the Christian but God also has angels to perform their duty of taking sin and sinners and casting them into hellfire and damnation. And he did this also in time, at the time of the Egyptians. Some of you will remember the great Passover. Uh, the Egyptians rebelled against God and God said okay I've sent you all forms of pestilence cursed you with with tremendous darkness and turned your rivers into blood etc etc right this is the final warning I'm gonna strike down your firstborn unless you let my people go you must let my people go Moses goes to Pharaoh Pharaoh says no way will I do such a thing. Moses pronounces the, the judgment of God upon the situation and explains to Moses that he must take a lamb and he must take the blood of that lamb having slain it and daub the, the doorposts and the lintel, uh, the part of the door that was above, uh, daub it with the lamb's blood and that blood will then prevent and be a sign to the angel of death not to strike down that family not to touch that family so the angel of death as it passed over that's why they call it the feast of the passover as it passed over these homes it saw the blood and it stopped the judgment those that didn't see the blood the firstborn was killed firstborn cattle firstborn sons um, were removed from the palace to the peasant 
everyone suffered bereavement that night. There was that terrible angel of death performing that hellish duty. But then there was the rejoicing of the blood of the Lamb, typical of the blood of Jesus, hallelujah, our great Passover Lamb, that prevented the judgment from falling. Oh, hallelujah. The indignation of God against sin. Listen to that rain. Bertha is, is here, my word. Um, and it's, a, it's amazing, isn't it? The extraordinary, the extraordinary um, violence of God upon sin. Let me read these verses to you. Oh God, help these verses become real to all of us. I don't just want to read the Bible, you know that. I want to actually make it ever so real to you by the Holy Spirit applying it. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach. And to them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. So here we have an angel that's preaching the gospel, saying with a loud voice, Fear God! Give glory to Him! For the hour of his judgment is come, and, the, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of God's indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Extraordinary, isn't it? Extraordinary and terrible uh, judgment of God's indignation, the wrath of God being poured out without mixture, without dilution, the cup of his indignation poured out upon those who are following after the beast, who are following after the devil and his angels. Again you have the devil's angels, a place prepared for them, called hellfire, called damnation, called the lake of fire. And that place, that terrible place, is where also sinners will be who do not repent and believe the gospel. God's indignation. We've seen the illustration, we've seen God's indignation try to give you a reason why God is so indignant, why God is so angry, why God is so furious at sin, at mankind, why God is so upset, rightly so, he is holy, he is thrice holy, we are sinful. Let's look at the infinite, the infinite, we've looked at the illustration, we've looked at the, the indignation, let's look at the infinite this is an everlasting punishment hellfire and damnation seems extraordinary doesn't it that this everlasting suffering uh, should be spent upon men and women should be spent upon people who've, who have turned their backs upon God in time but it's true and the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name there's no rest it's forever it's continual people will say to you oh no there's for, for a start there's no such place as hell and the idea it could be eternal no but it's the only remedy for sin it's the only remedy out with of course, the sweet Lord Jesus himself, who suffered hell for those whom the Father had given 
him. The illustration, we see the indignation, but we also see it's infinite. It has to be. God's infinite wrath and anger and indignation was poured out upon Jesus at the cross. Jesus drank of the cup of the wrath of God. Jesus peered into that cup. He recoiled at first because that wrath and that, that, that horror of great darkness was because of our sin. He became our sin that we might be made the righteousness of God. But love looked into that cup and love drank it up. Hallelujah. Oh, it's wonderful, isn't it? It's solemn. It's sobering. It's extraordinary. Let me finish by saying this. We've looked at the illustration. We've looked at the indignation. We've seen quite clearly from Scripture that this, this place called hell is infinite. It's also, oh hallelujah, there's also though the great hope of an intercessor. It speaks of the, of the wicked, but it speaks also of the just. And the just, Romans 5 tells us, shall live by faith alone. And where does that faith come from? Hallelujah. It's wonderful, isn't it? The way the scriptures put it. It gave great blessing uh, to Martin Luther five centuries ago. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Perhaps you're wondering um, how terrible how wicked your heart is what could remedy it what could what, what could what could possibly uh, change it how could you be resurrected from your the death of your trespasses and sins hallelujah you can be saved through the intercession of the lord jesus christ when jesus was lifted up from the earth he hung as it were in midair upon that cross he became a great mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. He was cursed that we might not be cursed by sin. He was, he was pained. You know, the, the hell it speaks of as having a terrible darkness. They call it outer darkness. You know how dark this is? You can't even see your, face, your hand in front of your face. That's how dark it is. And all you can hear is weeping, is wailing, and is gnashing of teeth. You remember that the darkness covered the face of the earth when Jesus was dying on the cross for three hours. For three hours. I think it was between 12 and 3. For three hours he, he writhed in agony upon that cross. He cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He suffered the darkness that you as a Christian should have suffered or should suffer in hellfire, in damnation. They gnashed their teeth at the Lord Jesus whilst he was on that cross. That happened so that you might be spared the gnashing of teeth that takes place in hell. You know why people gnash their teeth? They're grinding their teeth to try to, to alleviate the pain I've actually seen people in so much pain, they grind their teeth. That's, a, that's a, an illustration. Uh, they do it because they're suffering. I've actually seen people's teeth actually worn down with all the grinding that they're doing because they're in so much pain. Now amplify that um, many times over and you have a sense of what's going on in hell. As people gnash their teeth, as people um, suffer in agony there's weeping there's wailing the women uh, who surrounded the lord jesus at the cross were wailing they were weeping they were crying and jesus says don't cry for me cry uh, rather for your sons and for your sons sons cry because there's a judgment coming that, that you, you can't avoid weep not for me there was weeping at the cross the mother of the lord jesus was there um, there was tremendous weeping um, even though peter wasn't there he knew he'd betrayed the Lord and he went away and he wept bitterly. There was lots of weeping, lots of crying. 
All that was suffered by the Lord Jesus, that you might not experience that in hell. The gnashing of teeth, the outer darkness, the furnace of fire. When, when um, at the end of the world, all bodies will be resurrected, some to damnation, some to glorification. But you'll be given a body and that body will not, will not, dis people say, once I'm dead, I'm dead. You're not. You're not. You'll, you're, you're an eternal person, an eternal soul, for good or bad. You don't, your body will die. It will disappear. The worms will have their, their feast upon you. If not, then you'll be, you'll, you'll be um, uh, burnt with fire, as many um, experience, or rather, would rather uh, be, have their bodies disposed of that way. But whichever way, God brings all these bad bodies back to, uh, to, to bear and, and resurrects them all, and they're reunited with the spirits, uh, their spirit and, and, and their bodies then. You'll be given a body, if you're out with Christ, that will, will manage to suffer, but not die. Manage to experience the terrible fires of hell, yet not be consumed. Remember Moses with the burning bush? The bush that burnt, yet never was consumed? Same idea, same principle. A furnace of fire, where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Outer darkness. All of these amazing uh, uh, signs and, and, um, and illustrations, human illustrations of a, of a much deeper and, and awful um, uh, uh, element of hell, fire and damnation. All of these things Jesus suffered like on the cross that you might be spared such an experience. Oh, the intercessor, the intercessor. Why will you not be separated from God? Because he was separated from God. Why will you not suffer the outer darkness of hellfire and damnation? Because he suffered the outer darkness upon the cross. Why do you not experience the gnashing of teeth? Because he felt that upon himself as people threw into his teeth. If thou be the son of God, come down! If you, if you really are who you say you are, then let's, let's see, does he call upon Elijah? Does he call upon uh, someone else to rescue him? And they railed upon him, and even those first that were crucified with him mocked him, although one remarkably, by the grace of God, came to know the Lord Jesus Christ as his personal saviour, whilst hanging on the cross next to Jesus, and Jesus says to him, today, Thou shalt be with me in paradise. And this awful, awful, hideous place called hell, Jesus suffered that we might go free. Just a couple of things in closing, sought to illustrate this subject to you. Feel as if I've failed miserably to to show you the depth of it listen to this is a this is a, a great poem great in in uh, in fame it's from the inferno by dante it's the gate of hell it's called there's a few lines from it i am the way into the city of woe i am the way to a forsaken people i am the way to eternal sorrow Sacred justice moved my architect. I was raised here by divine omnipotence. Primordial love and ultimate intelligence. Only those elements time cannot wear were made before me and beyond time I stand. Abandon all hope, ye that enter in. Again, a very graphic poem on the the subject of hell here's a here's a story just in closing very solemn story again in the 18th century Archibald Boyle was the leading member of an association of wild and wicked men known as the hell club 
you believe, a club that actually called itself the Hell Club in Glasgow, Scotland. After one night of carousing at the club's notorious annual meeting, Boyle dreamed he was riding home on his black horse. In the darkness, someone seized the reins. Someone seized the reins shouting, you must go with me! As Boyle desperately tried to force the reins from the hands of the unknown guide, the horse reared and Boyle fell down, down, down with increasing speed. Where are you taking me? The cold voice replied, to hell. The echoes of the groans and yells of frantic revelry assaulted their ears and at the entrance to hell Bo Boyle saw the inmates chasing the same pleasures they pursued in life. There was a lady he'd known playing her favourite vulgar game. Boyle relaxed thinking hell must be a pleasurable place after all. When he asked her to rest a moment and show him through the pleasures of hell she shrieked. There is no rest in hell. She unclasped the vest of her robe and displayed a coil of living snakes writhing about her midsection. Others revealed different forms of pain in their hearts. Take me away from this place, Bull demanded, by the living God whose name I have so often outraged. I beg you, let me go. His, re his guide replied, go then. But in a year and a day, we meet to part no more. At this boil awoke, feeling that these last words were as letters of fire burned into his very heart. Despite a resolution never to attend the Hell Club again, he was soon drawn back. He found no comfort there. He grew haggard and grey under the weight of his conscience and fear of the future. He dreaded attending the club's annual meeting. But his companions forced him to attend. Every nerve of his body writhed in agony at the first sentence of the president's opening address. Gentlemen, this is leap year, therefore it is a year and a day since our last annual meeting. After the meeting, Archibald Boyle mounted his horse to ride home. Next morning his horse was found grazing quietly by the roadside. A few yards away, lay the corpse of Archibald Boyle. The strange guide had claimed him at the appointed time. You're getting a message tonight. You're getting a message. It's a message that has been laid upon my heart, that was laid upon the Saviour's heart to begin with, of the reality of hell. What are you going to do with it? Where are you going to go with it? I'm handing it over to you. I'm giving you the facts of the matter. There's an eternity of separation from God in a place called hell. I'm giving you the, the wonderful intercessor himself, the Lord Jesus Christ, to turn to, to cry to, to pray to, to beg for forgiveness from, to repent from your old life and to believe the gospel. How long will it be until your appointed time? There's an appointed time. We're all appointed to die. And then the judgment. We're all going to die one day. Some sooner than others. Almost certainly. Um, within a hundred years, all of us will be away. All of us will be gone. For some it could be less. I remember preaching on the, the, the dark, the black horses of Revelations. And one of those horses was um, called Death. And the scripture says, Death, the horse Death came, and hell followed that great horse. And I challenged the congregation that night. It was in another church, Zion Baptist Church. I challenged the congregation. I says, There may well be standing on the platform in front of me here one of the elders of this church announcing the death of someone who you all know the death of a woman that you know and that 
might even be you. It might even be you. And extraordinarily, it came true. Some of you remember our sister Bab Stephen. That was the very week that she passed away, the beginning of that week. And, the, and on, on that Wednesday, uh, uh, one of the elders stood up and, and announced the fact that she'd passed away. And a girl who was present, who had especially convicted, she was in tears at the end of that meeting, especially convicted, knew Babs personally. It was a word from the Lord. It was a word for there and now. I know it. I could feel it. I could feel the impact of it. Did she repent and believe the gospel? No. The time was there. The moment came. She never gripped it. She never grasped it. She never, she never took advantage of, that, of the day of salvation that came. Oh, I pray that she'll, another time will, will arrive in her life which will bring her to that great crossroads. But these moments, they come and they go. They're not many. In life we aren't confronted, confronted too often with the frailty of life. With how, how vulnerable we are as human beings. How frail we are. How we are all just fleeting, like a dream, like a vapour, passing away. Oh, you need to lay hold on these things. You need to pray. You need to beg the Lord Jesus to come into your life, to save you, to redeem you by the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, who has cleansed us from all our sin. The, 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 the glorious way out of hell is there. It's the Lord Jesus. Read his, his, his writings, read his pleadings, read his, his, um, what he speaks of so eloquently when it comes to hell. Don't be like Archibald Boyle. Don't, don't even have the day and the hour that you'll be taken and still the hardness of your heart stops you from giving all to Jesus. Lovely hymn that we sing occasionally. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence. Daily live. I surrender all. I surrender all. Oh, how we need to flee from the wrath to come. You know, in hell they know the answer. It's too late. It's too late. In hell they know what they should do. But they can't do it any longer. The time has gone. It's passed by. Oh, and the, the sand, it slips through our hands, doesn't it? The sands of time are sinking. It just seems as if it was yesterday. When, when uh, we were challenged on the gospel, and on, on eternity, on the things of God. All these years now later, you can be rich. I read the last words of Princess Diana. Who, wonder who knows what the last words of Princess Diana were? My God, what's happening? Woman, in the, in the bloom of her, of her youth, fame, there was celebrities, there was Hollywood starlets, then there was Princess Diana. Great boyfriend, uh, in Dodi, fired, living the high life, then involved in a terrible car accident, in a Paris tunnel, and just like that, her life, with so much going for it was snatched away was removed and as someone reached the car before she slipped into unconsciousness my god what's happening it's too late though her life was taken her life was gone oh Ridley and Cranmer were suffering a martyr's death I think it was Cranmer said to Ridley as they both burned at the stake. Never mind, Master Ridley. Today 
we will light a candle in England God willing will be never put out what a way to die eh what a remarkable way to die prophetic words that came true because to this day the martyrdom of these great men of God is the very seed of the church that we still benefit from in this 21st century going to live for him or are you just going to slip away are you just going to oh the road to hell is paved with good intentions I'll get down on my knees tonight tomorrow night next week I'll get my life sorted out I'll do something about this now is the day of salvation has to be now because the Lord's come near avoid this this horror of great darkness avoid the end of the world and the angels that would come to separate the just from the wicked drag them away that's the sense severed sever they're dragged away they obviously don't come willingly you're not gonna you're not gonna go arm in arm with an angel into hell are you no they fight they kick they spit but no, no one's a match of, a, of one of God's holy angels dragged away into hell oh dear friends if you don't know Jesus know him this day know him this night give your life to the saviour and when sin when the devil tries to drag you away he'll drag you back with his prayers with his love for you with the fact that he's died for you and he'll make sure your faith fails not he'll make you strong in the hour of temptation and he'll give you power over sin oh give your life to him what a savior he is why would you not go with him why would you reject the the imploring the begging the 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 the, the savior crying and, and and pleading with you oh i'll tell you why this rotten evil wicked sinful heart oh soften your heart soften your heart tonight how do i become a christian oh if you believe in your heart if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead thou shalt be saved Romans 10 and 9 exercise the faith of God this night lay hold upon Calvary and be saved from hell in Jesus precious name Amen